A reproduction. Um, and so there's two types of reproduction, and we're going to talk about uh, asexual reproduction first. Okay, asexual reproduction is when a single parent produces genetically identical offspring. Genetically identical offspring. Okay, and uh, it is the way that prokaryotes are going to uh, always reproduce. And so we call prokaryotic uh, asexual reproduction, we call that binary fission. Binary fission. Binary fission is the simplest form of cell division. It is actually just a physical division of the cell. There's no uh, fancy mitosis dance, no fancy uh, you know, chromosomes lining up on the metaphase plate and then being yanked apart. Uh, it's as simple as the chromosome fusing to the plasma membrane and then the plasma membrane dividing. And it breaks the chromosome in half when it, um, when it divides. And so very, very simple. It can happen very quickly. And so that's one of the things that bacteria have going for them is that they can divide super fast. And so their generational spans tend to be very small, um, as short as like say 20 minutes, right? So if you consider the fact that um, our generational span, our human generational span is somewhere where like 15 to 20 years, right? Uh, and it's moving back even further than that, then um, 20 minutes seems even crazier. So, you know, a, a bacteria will go through millions of generational spans in the time we go through just a couple, right? So, um, eukaryotic cells um, have cell division that's asexual, and we call that mitosis. Right? That's the, the type of reproduction that it results in genetically identical offspring. Right? And so that's why your cells can reproduce through mitosis because it's going to create an identical copy of the cell that it came from. Right? Uh, and then the last one is interesting. It's um, a multicellular asexual reproduction. And the multicellular asexual reproduction is commonly called budding. Okay? And what happens in budding is that um, a part of an organism will break off, okay? And then instead of that part just dying that broke off, that part will then develop into a whole new organism, right? An organism that's identical. So um, places where you can see this uh, in starfish, if you cut a starfish just right, a starfish will, will regenerate into two separate starfish, right? Um, corals can do it. And uh, so that's actually their, their main method of reproduction in corals is by butting off new parts and the new parts become separate organisms to the point where you could actually sever them off and they would, they would be totally unique. Um, plants go through budding a lot. Um, there are actually a bunch of really important cultivars, really important plants that, that we grow uh, for commercial use that are only asexually reproduced. Uh, one really important example of that is the banana, right? Um, so all bananas are only reproduced asexually, and the reason why that's important is because bananas have giant um, hard seeds in them, right, in the banana fruit. And I don't think any of you guys have ever eaten a banana that has giant hard seeds in it, right? That's because all the bananas that we produce are sterile, and so they don't produce seeds, right? But if they did produce seeds, then they wouldn't really be that good to eat because you'd be breaking your teeth on them all the time. Right, so we produce these asexually produced or asexually reproduction ones uh, that can't actually sexually reproduce. Okay, um, the downside to asexual reproduction is that all of the organisms that are asexually reproducing are going to be genetically identical to one another. Then, okay, and if you're genetically identical, that means that your uh, community, your your um, 
ecological stability is low. And the reason for that is that if anything happens that affects one of the organisms, it's probably going to affect all of them because they're all genetically identical, right? So you're ready for something mind-blowing? Have you guys ever eaten um, like uh, banana runts or banana Laffy Taffy? Does it taste like bananas? No. Okay. But it actually does taste like bananas. It tastes like what bananas used to taste like in 1950. Right? Um, so all the bananas that we eat right now are a banana that's called the Cavendish banana. And the Cavendish banana is uh, relatively recent. Um, before that, there was a banana called the Big Mike banana that tasted like banana Laffy Taffy and banana runts and all those things. Right? Um, but it fell susceptible to a disease. Right? And so all of the Big Mike bananas died off. Right? And in fact, for about two years, there was a, a uh, global banana shortage, a banana crisis, if you will, where you couldn't get bananas because all the farms that were growing Big Mike bananas died. You know, the, all the Big Mike bananas on those farms died of this disease. Right? And so they had to come up, they had to find a new banana, a, a new strain of banana that wasn't susceptible to this disease or that could grow in areas where this disease was still prevalent. Okay? And so we came up with this new banana called the Cavendish banana. And the Cavendish banana has been our banana for about 40 or 50 years now. Right? So uh, what happens when the Cavendish banana gets a disease? Find a new strain of banana. In fact, there are top men right now at Chiquita and, and Dole trying to find a new strand of banana because um, the Cavendish banana already has a problem. There's a weevil that affects the Cavendish banana, an insect that grows up through the stem of the banana plant uh, and then grows into the bananas. And so if you go to like Dole or Chiquita or any of those places where they're growing them right now, uh, they have to take each new banana plant and they break the banana bushel off the stem, uh, they bend them to the side because the, the weevil burrows straight up the stem. And so um, if they didn't do that, it would burrow into the fruits and, and then you'd have insects in your fruit. Uh, but since they, they break them off, the weevil just comes straight out the top of the stem and dies because they've broken the, the fruits off to the side now. So you, they'll all see them hanging over to the side. Now. It's a larva, so no, it's just, it's really... Just kind of doing its thing. They are still attached. They're attached. They're just broken to the side. They're like hanging over to the side. Yeah. How do they like find the new strain? Just go out in the wild and find one, or like? Yep. So Cavendish Cavendish banana is a wild strand, um, but there are also strands um, that are being you know. GMO essentially, where they're 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 purposely splicing strands together that are resistant to um, disease and and taste good also. Uh, bananas come in all kinds of different tastes and and uh, consistencies and stuff like now. Uh, yeah, like if you go to Davis Island, uh, the thousand figure bananas are really popular, really common on on Davis Island. Um, where do you, what do you mean? Where do you get them? No, it's not like the Davis Island banana, but a lot of people on Davis Island, on their property, have thousand-figure bananas. They're like really small ones that are like this big, uh, and they grow like a like hundred to a bushel instead of like ten to a bushel. What? Yeah, I mean, they taste just like Cavendish bananas. Um, but there are also strains of bananas that uh, taste more like apples. Uh, they, they've got a little bit of crunch to them. Um, uh, yeah, pl plantains are like in the same grouping, the same genus um, of, of bananas. But anyways, the point is here that asexual reproduction is generally bad because all the organisms are going to be genetically identical. And if all the organisms are genetically identical, that means they're susceptible to one thing. Okay? Um, there's a lot of variation in the human genome. And so it's very unlikely that we're all going to be susceptible to one thing. Right? We are constantly hearing stories of people in you know, remote parts of the world that like, don't get cancer and don't get AIDS and things like that. And we're like, we can't even comprehend how that would be the case. But our genetic variations are so significant, right? and, and we're talking about like 0.1% max right, of our genome being different. But that's enough, it's enough genes that are different that it really spawns a lot of different immunities to different things so that if there were some global epidemic that 
you know, cause everybody to turn into zombies or something like that, there's a very good chance that there would be people who would be genetically immune to that because of the differences in their genome, um, because of all the mixing. What? It, yeah, you wouldn't want to be one of the people that was immune to being a zombie. Like, if, if there's a zombie apocalypse, I'm like the first to just yeah. go be a zombie. <laughs> yeah, like, yeah that's, that's real. That's, that's how I feel. That's yeah. like one of my biggest fears. Yeah. A zombie apocalypse? Yeah. I was going to isolate myself well, on an island. It could happen. It could totally happen. That's not my biggest fear. I mean, it's a good fear to have. It is a good fear. It could happen. Yeah. Did you, know, did you know that in our genomes, there are all kinds of really old viruses that are just like laying dormant from like millions of years ago. Our ancestors millions of years ago got viruses and they implanted themselves into our genome and then they're just like not, yeah, they're just, they're just not doing anything right now. Right? They could do something. They could. What if there's like just one day though? There's not yet, but maybe there would be later. <laughs> All right. <laughs> sexual reproduction. All right, so uh, sexual reproduction is when uh, two parents, when two parents, or parent cells, rather, um, Combine genes to form genetically unique offspring. Okay, so um, two parents is sometimes a little bit not true, uh, like plants have both male and female gametes, and so a plant can self-fertilize. So it doesn't necessarily have to be, uh, why is my Dropbox almost full? That's frightening. Uh, all right, anyways, so did I, did I, I see a lot of people squinting. Did I write something ridiculous up here? Oh, genes, yeah. Genes. If I do say something ridiculous, I am quite tired today, so just let me know that being ridiculous. Uh, all right, so let's look at this. I'm gonna be a little sexist here. I'm sorry. I'm gonna do a male in blue. The female is gonna be pink, and the female is gonna be smaller. Okay. Sorry. Okay. So humans in every single one of our cells. Well every single one of our um, somatic cells, we have 46 chromosomes. Okay? And if every single one of our cells had 46 chromosomes, that means that when they combine together through the process of fertilization, that the offspring would have 92 chromosomes, right? And then they would grow up with 92 chromosomes, and then their offspring would have 184 chromosomes, and then their offspring would have 368 chromosomes, right? And it wouldn't take very long until there was just no room in the cell for anything other than the chromosomes, right? So that would be bad, obviously. And so we can't do that. We can't, we can't just double our chromosome number every year, every generation rather. So what we have to do is we have to half the chromosome number first. We have to cut it in half. And the process that does that is called meiosis. Okay, so the process of meiosis, we go from having 46 chromosomes into having cells that contain 23 chromosomes. And the cells that contain 23 chromosomes in um, a, a male, those are called sperm cells. And in females, uh, it's commonly called an egg, but uh, the actual term for it is the ova. Oops. Right? Sperm and ova. And these cells have 23 chromosomes. So then when sperm and ova combine, through a process called fertilization, it 
forms a single cell. Let's say this cell uh, happens to have a Y chromosome on it, so it's going to be a male, this particular one. But this is going to be a zygote. Okay, and it could be male or female, just happens to be that in this situation it is a male. Okay. How many chromosomes in a zygote? 46, 23 plus 23, right? So you guys might have heard there was like this this um, old wives tale slash ridiculous story that, that everybody kind of took hold of that um, like within the first eight weeks of pregnancy or something like that your baby doesn't have a sex and then like it yes. it and, you, that, and then it like it, so yeah it, what's not true <laughs> well I mean think about it right that, that they always have the X chromosome or the Y chromosome Sure, physically they haven't differentiated enough to act, uh, yet to actually matter, but there used to be a thing that was like they would tell pregnant women to do certain things like during the first eight weeks if they wanted a girl or like if they wanted a boy, but it's predetermined genetically because it's either going to get a Y chromosome or it's not going to get a Y chromosome, and if it gets one, then it's a male, and if it doesn't, it's a female, right? There's, you can't change anything about that, right? So um, this thing is going to go through some cell divisions. It's going to go through weird cell divisions. Um, these cell divisions uh, are mitotic cell divisions. It's mitosis. But it's a special type of mitosis that's called cleavage. Okay? And what happens in cleavage is that the cells divide, but they don't grow. Right? And so the zygote is really big, and um, it is going to divide into a ball of cells. It goes into a four cell stage and an eight cell stage. And then it goes into this ball of cells that is the same size as the zygote was, but all the individual cells are significantly smaller because it's gone through cleavage. Okay, this ball of cells is called a blastula. And then after that, it um, gets a pore in it, like uh, an indented region, like this. What's that? I said there's a smart way to make the circles. More squiggling? Okay, this is called a um, gastrula now. And in a gastrula, um, there's no differentiation yet. All the cells are still stem cells at this point. And then it'll go through normal mitosis. So differentiation and mitosis are happening here. Mitosis and differentiation. And it forms then a little baby. And the way that you draw a little baby is you draw them with a, a body like that and you draw a giant head on them and that makes them look like a baby. <laughs> Because babies have giant heads. But it will look the guys too. You mean proportionally the body. Yes. Okay. That's very unfortunate. <laughs> Alright. So then uh, it's gotta hold their brains. They're developing. Alright, and then it's gonna go through more mitosis here. And it will then grow up to be a big strong man. And then he'll go through mitosis, or sorry, go through meiosis rather, to make sperm cells. And that's the circle of life.
All right. So, we've got all these fancy words to talk about chromosome numbers. Okay, probably the most important word for you guys to know is this word haploid because it's, um, it's the minimum number of chromosomes that you can have. Haploid is the minimum number of chromosomes for an organism to have all of its parts. Okay, so what do I mean by that? I mean that like if you think of a human as having like eyes and ears and, and two arms and two legs and a heart and stuff like that, right? If you start taking away one of our chromosomes, right? Like our, our haploid number is 23. If you went to 22, we might be missing one of those parts, eyes or heart or arms or something like that, right? So you have to have the haploid number. Okay, so for humans, the haploid number is 23. Okay, there are 23 unique chromosomes, right? And we number them 1 through 23, and we call the 23rd chromosome the sex chromosome. That's the one that can either be an X chromosome or a Y chromosome. And if you have two X chromosomes, that makes you a female. If you have an X and a Y, that makes you a male. Okay? Um, the way that we write this, right, is N is equal to 23, where N represents the haploid number of chromosomes. Okay. But humans are not haploid. Humans are diploid. Okay? Which means that you have two sets. Diploid, right? Means two. Two sets of the haploid number. Okay? So we can say that human somatic cells... have 46 chromosomes which the way that we write that is 2n is equal to 46 okay most organisms are going to be haploid or are going to be diploid or haploid, okay? Um, but there are some strange instances, like our friend the banana, right? Bananas are triploid, okay? Which means they have three sets, okay? Which is three n. There's also tetraploid. Just four sets. Four n, and then we're not going to go all the way up to you know ten, but there is decaploid, right? In fact, there's some really weird ones, uh, weird plants that are like 128 n or something like that. Uh, but those are so few and far between. And we'll talk later about why plants are much more likely to be polyploid uh, than than humans are, or than uh, animals are. Uh, and it has to do with our life cycles, but we'll, we'll cover all that later, okay? So what I want to talk about next is um, the terms that we're going to use to describe chromosomes because this is one of the things that uh, confuses people a lot. So chromosome terminology. And I want to talk about the difference between sister chromatids And then also we'll talk about um, homologous chromosomes. Okay, but the first thing I want to know is sister chromatids. So what is true about the DNA on sister chromatids? It's identical. It's 100% identical. They're exact copies. Okay, so uh, they contain 
100% identical copies of DNA. And we know that there's two sister chromatids per chromosome, okay, during uh, mitosis. Then, homologous chromosomes. What's true about the DNA on homologous chromosomes? You ever heard that term, homologous chromosomes? It's the same sort of, yeah. Is it that like they um, code for like the same gene or whatever, but like they're different? Yes. So so they are the same type of information, but they're not necessarily the exact same information. Okay. So the, these are um, chromosomes. That code. For the same type of information, that is the term. The term that we would use for that is genes. They code for the same genes, but can have different versions of that information. which is something that we refer to as alleles. Okay, so genes are, let's see an example. Okay, and I'm gonna do a lot of these kind of crummy examples. Um, and I don't want you to get the wrong idea about it. I'm going to use like hair color and eye color and things like that because they're really easy for us to just visualize and it's tangible and stuff like that. But understand that most of your genes are not coding for little things like pigments. Like that's it's totally insignificant. Most of your genes are coding for really important stuff like the enzymes that allow you to break down proteins and like uh, the sodium potassium pump that allows your nervous, uh, nervous system to work. Like they have real like biological functions and not just like a neat color of something. A lot of people think about genes and like, oh yeah, that's why I hate my hair is brown. And sure it is why your hair is brown, but it's also the reason why you're not dead. So <laughs> that's probably more important. All right. So we can say an example would be something like um, hair color. Okay. So we would say that um, both homologous chromosomes would code for a pigment for hair that we would call a gene. Okay, but maybe one codes for brown or the other one codes for red, right? And so these are alleles. Okay, now we'll talk about what, what um, dominance is a little bit later, but for the most part, you can sort of understand here. Imagine you had one gene that coded for a brown pigment and one gene that coded for a red pigment. Right? We would say brown is dominant to red, and the reason for that, think about a marker. Right? If I take a, a Crayola marker and I draw a red line, right? and then I take a brown Crayola marker and I draw over the red line, what color is the line? Brown. It's brown. Right? What if I do it the opposite way? What if I take a brown marker and I draw on a piece of paper, and then I take a red marker and I draw on top of it? What color is it? Brown. brown right? Once you go brown, you can't go back. It's like, <laughs> that's the end. Okay. So, uh, let's talk about let's talk about meiosis. So meiosis is the process of cutting the chromosome number in half. Process of having the chromosome number. Okay, and so the way that it does that is in two different stages. Uh, the first one's called meiosis one. 
And meiosis one uh, has uh, prophase. Prophase one, metaphase one. Anaphase one. And then sometimes you'll see telophase one also. Um, and then sometimes you'll see instead of telophase, something called interkinesis, uh, which is a cool sounding word. So what happens in prophase one, here's a cell. And our cell, we're gonna do, I don't know, let's do two, chromos two chromosomes. We'll do a big, long chromosome and we'll do a small chromosome, okay? And then we have the homologous pair. So again, one that looks just like it, but maybe in a different color. So big chromosome, small chromosome. Okay, in prophase, what happens is these things are actually going to form something that are called tetrads, okay? And tetrads are when um, homologous chromosomes actually cross over each other and they join up to form uh, something that has four sister chromatids in it. That's why it's called a tetrad. In your book, it's called something slightly different. They call them bivalents, which is also a, an okay term. Um, bivalent by means two chromosomes. So it means that, that both of the homologous chromosomes are there, okay? So again, these things, when they go from uh, prophase into metaphase, they're gonna line up on the metaphase plate, okay? But they line up differently than they did before, okay? So there's my metaphase plate. They're gonna line up in their tetrads or bivalents or whatever you wanna call them, okay? So you can see how the little tails are crossed over each other there, and they're lined up in these groups of four sister chromatids. And then during anaphase, they get yanked apart, okay? And then they'll end up with two cells at the end. And those two cells then have two chromosomes in them. one of each type, one long one and one uh, short one, right? So at the beginning, this cell started out as 2n, so we'd say 2n is equal to four. All right, and if 2n is equal to four, what's my n value over here? So these are diploid cells to start with. And they're haploid over here. Okay, but there's only there's only two cells here, and meiosis is going to end up with four cells. It's going to go through meiosis two. Okay, and meiosis two has again uh, another prophase, metaphase, it's prophase two, metaphase two. Anaphase two, telophase. Okay, and so uh, the good news about this is this is identical to the process of uh, mitosis. So if you know mitosis, you'll be set here. So we've got two cells from before, right? One of them had the long chromosome in blue and the short chromosome in red. The other one was the opposite. Okay, these guys are gonna line up on the metaphase plate. Spindles are gonna attach like normal. And then they are going to get yanked apart. And when they get yanked apart, 
now four cells. And those four cells are long blue chromosome, long blue chromosome, short blue chromosome, short blue chromosome, short red, short red, long red, long red. So at the end of meiosis, you can say meiosis results in four genetically unique cells with half as many chromosomes. So um, we were slightly uh, anthropocentric when we named these things um, because a lot of people oftentimes say that after meiosis, the cells are haploid, and that's not really true. It sounds like it's going to be because haploid sounds like half, but what if the original cell was tetraploid? After meiosis, a tetraploid cell will be what? Diploid, right? Because it had 4n, and then you cut it in half, and that's 2n. Right? What's that? What if it's like a um, tetroid, like 3? Three? 3? It's a good question. Can't happen. Because you can't cut that in half, can you? It can't be 1.5n. Yeah, so what happens with like. You get bananas. <laughs> bananas are triploid which means that they can't go through meiosis because there's no such thing as 1.5n, right? And so that means they don't produce seeds because their seeds are produced through the process of meiosis. And that's why we can eat bananas. Yeah. So in humans, like this one only had like 4 chromosomes in it, so we would have, so we would have like 46. 46, and then at the end we'd have 23. Okay. Yep. Anybody have questions on that? All right, that's it.